Tommy sells as a prisoner in Texas. If the state has its way, he'll be dead within the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where prison staff is preparing to put Tommy Sells to death by injecting him with a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will broadcast live coverage of the killing in Texas the state responsible for more than a third of all U.S. executions. Execution Watch host Ray Hill, legal analyst Jim Skelton, with criminal defense attorneys Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, Mike Gillespie, and Jack Lee. Huntsville reporter outside the death house Gloria Rubeck, Houston vigil reporter Jennifer Simmons. Tonight's featured guest is the condemned man himself, Tommy Sells, who recorded an interview with Execution Watch last month from death row. The execution watch for Tommy Sells begins. Good evening, this is Ray Hill. It is uh, the third day of April 2014, and tonight they're going to kill uh, Tommy Sells. Uh, I interviewed Tommy Sells. I understand we're having technical difficulties with the radio version of the interview. We, however... We're going to have a longer version of the interview uh, on the televised version of this. So I'm going to take a few minutes here uh, since we're going to have to fill a long program without an interview because the interview was to be 20 minutes and, uh, on this show and longer on the television show. Uh, so uh, I trust that somebody's working on the technology out there. And we may have the interview, but at present we do not. Uh, the interview with Tommy Sales will be played on Houston Media Source at a time announced. Now, this is how you stay in touch with what we are doing uh, so that you will know when it is put up. You join our Facebook page. Uh, Execution Watch has a Facebook page. You can find us by going to your Facebook index asking for Execution Watch. And when you ask for that, they will plug you in and bring you up uh, to Hoyle on that, and you can... Uh, uh, watch the show, including the interview with Tommy Sales. Uh, Tommy is um, in um, Huntsville, Texas. Uh, he is in the Death Watch sale, and he is awaiting uh, uh, the witnesses to cross the road. Uh, hello, uh, board up. Can I get you to um, put Richard on the air? Richard, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Ray. The witnesses have just crossed the road. The witnesses, you mean the media witnesses? Were there any other witnesses? Uh, yes, there were. Okay, so so t uh, Tommy has somebody there uh, uh, at his request to uh, witness his execution. Yes, sir. There were two groups of people that were led separately across the road. Okay, so to our audience, so that you know what's going on, when the witnesses crossed the road from the old administration building, into the walls unit that means the process has begun the witnesses do not go in until tommy is strapped on the gurney and the needles are in his arms it's a matter of moments now before they start uh, asking him for his last words uh, and then whenever he gets through with that uh, they will apply the chemicals there's some discussion about that richard i want to thank you for calling in richard nebels is our reporter in huntsville tonight and, uh, Richard, I would appreciate your calling me if uh, they come out. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Do we have uh, uh, a reporter from another vigil tonight? No, actually, because I think that um, uh, there is an int, uh, event going on out at TSU tonight about police brutality. And Dave, uh, uh, who is... Uh, uh, Dave Atwood, who is normally our reporter from the vi vigil, is at TSU, and he is um, participating in that event. Uh, Jim, what do you know about Tommy Sales and what happened in this case? First off, this is one of those cases where it's really, really difficult to separate fact from fiction because 
Uh, the story he kind of tells is that he had been wandering around since he was a young kid, 13 or 14, bumming for food and killing people is what he basically said. But what we know for certain in this particular case, he ended up in Del Rio, Texas, and he broke into a home of a Harris family in Del Rio. And in the home was a 13-year-old girl by the name of Kaylin. And he sexually assaulted her. Then when he finished sexually assaulting her, he cut his throat and stabbed her something like 16 times. And there's a 10-year-old girl spending the night with her at the home that night. And he did not sexually assault her, but he cut her throat also. She survived. And when she survived, when she was able to kind of help, she got a composite drawing of him. That's what led to his arrest. And, of course, he confessed to that, as well as a multiple, some number of other murders and crimes. He claimed 70. How many was he actually charged with? He's got a couple of cases pending in different states, but really the one major one has been in Texas. And there's been a, other assault cases we're going to discuss. This isn't the only, as far as murder is concerned, there are other cases he got convicted of, and we're going to talk about some of his prior convictions. Did he spend a lot of time in prison? No, not at all. In fact, the longest stretch he ever got was a 10-year sentence and didn't spend much time on that one. Was that in Texas? No, it was in West Virginia. West Virginia, okay. And he was he was traveling all around quite a bit. He was raised primarily in Missouri, born in Oakland, California, and apparently the, had a big problems at home. He stayed with a grand or, aunt or grandmother in Missouri. Then he pretty well was dumped when he was a young child. And after that, he just wandered around all over the country. The media calls him a drifter. Can you characterize what, what, what that would be? conjure in your mind? Sure. What he, according to what he, but see, it's hard to tell because a lot of it comes just from him and it's not verified. And apparently his, kind of, remember, remember Theodore Bundy, his trick on getting people to trust him, he'd act like he was crippled. He'd put a cast on his arm and be struggling, get a woman to help him. And then when the woman helped him, he ended up abducting, abducting, abducting her. And what he did, he was one of those guys that you see flagging signs at intersections. We'll work for food, I'm hungry. And apparently claimed to live under bridges, and that's how he lured many women to help him. I mean, primarily all of his victims were either women or young women, and so he apparently preyed upon, according to him. And from some of his priors, I will discuss that later with some of the other speakers. And it all usually is some type of young woman, and usually someone trying to help him because they felt sorry for him. So that was uh, uh, the image we have from looking over his criminal history. That, but I'm surprised that he hadn't done a lot of time. He has not. He didn't do hardly any time. He's, I think, do different stretches. And the longest time he was on a particular case Susan's going to talk about where he raped a woman and ended up spending some time there. But he didn't stay in prison that length, any length of time. Okay, you, Susan, you got a story for us? Okay, essentially what happens in, in this case is he is panhandling under an underpass and he has a sign, I'll work for food. The essential story is that a young woman feels sorry for him and she basically goes to give him some food. Susan, wasn't she? Was, I think she's kind of an army army child. She just didn't know a lot about America, right? Is that your That's impression? what she said. She said mm -hmm. she had lived at different military bases all over the place. So he had a sign saying, I'll work for food. Uh, apparently, she asked him if he was hungry. He said yes. She um, asked him if he had any family. He pulled out a picture of a woman with some kids and said that he and his wife and kids were all homeless and hungry. So she apparently was babysitting. She was staying at someone else's residence babysitting their cat. And there was some junk food that that person had bought, I guess, for her to have, and she didn't want it. So she went with him. She took him with her. They went to a convenience store. She bought him a newspaper there. She thought he could look for help in the want ads. And they went over to this place that she was staying at. When they went there, he asked her if she was there alone, and she said yes. And then she went and p packed up some food. She asked him to stay outside. She packed up the food, and then she went to get him a Coke. And then apparently he was just inside the, the, the residence. And then after that, he, she's trying to get rid of him, and she asked him if there's anything else he wanted. And he told her he wanted that his wife needed some underwear. So she went into, I guess, the bedroom where her suitcase was to give him some underwear. 
he followed her and then he ended up attacking her and he attacked her he he raped her but he also brought a knife in the kitchen right Susan yeah it was her knife it was a kitchen knife yeah and then they ended up in the bathroom she fought fought him was fighting with him and I guess there was a ceramic duck in the bathroom and she ended up hitting him over the head with the ceramic duck that sort of broke things up for a while where she was able to at least try to get away from him and she tried to get away and ran to the door but then he she wasn't able to get away and he caught her and then basically the attack kind of went on he you know tied her hands and feet up and she you know ended up telling him that she was pregnant and her husband would be home soon and that she wouldn't tell anyone what happened and he apparently put a blanket over her and made some half-hearted attempt to smother her and he ended up leaving and what she ended up I guess basically what she said is she ended up outside that she was beaten up bloody naked and on the front porch That's we left one thing out though during the struggle in the bathroom she took the knife away from him because that's how they caught him yeah because she stabbed him a number of times too, oh okay and he ends up in the hospital okay and that's one of the reasons they caught him because she's apparently a pretty spunky gal because she's the one that called him a wimp well no what she did <laughs> she beat him she said she hit him with that duck till nothing left was nothing left but the beak that's what she had in her hand. And somehow she got a hold of the knife. She began to stab him. Where the whip part came in, when she put the, he put the blanket over her head uh, to smother, she said it was a wimpy attempt to smother me. I mean, this you're talking about a spunky gal. She and so he This case up, was tried, or did he? He was tried. He pleaded to this he, case? No, no, he went to trial on it. And what happened after they go to trial on it... Um, Apparently, she made some contradictory statements because he was claiming consensual sex. He's claiming that he just met her and that she wanted to have she sex She was going to put him. it on him. That's right. And so uh, she, he claims consensual sex, and apparently some of her story was, was, stories were contradictory. And the prosecutor got concerned. He reduced the rape charges to, what's it called, Susan? Some they, they called it um, malicious wounding. Uh -huh. and and, reduced it to that and gave him a 10-year right. sentence. And how long did he serve in that 10-year, Susan? It was only about, what was it, a couple of years? A, co a couple of years, and then he paroled out. He did, as far as her in the attack where she fought back, not with the duck, but she also got the knife. He, he got 18 stab wounds. <laughs> She's did a good job on him, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, but this, in a, in a case where you've got a, a real committed witness like that, what kind of representation you have to take this sucker to trial? Uh, you, you know, I have no idea why we'd go to trial. I mean, that. if you had this case as a, as a defense lawyer. A lot of times you go to trial because the offer is so big that you think you can beat it from okay. the jury. And in this particular case, I don't, knew if the, I don't know if the defense lawyers knew ahead of time she's going to make contradictory statements. I have no idea. But remember, that was back during the time when we didn't have all the rape shield laws and a lot of protection for females who testified. And apparently did a pretty good number on her on cross-examination because she got a little bit confused. So, so he, he probably had some quality representation. It sounds like it because they had to they reduce the charges reduce from the charges rape and all that. And then there may be some. But it was a horrible case. Well, it was one of those cases where both of them got stabbed pretty well, yeah, good. Well, it was a pretty, pretty, pretty spicy case. And the cases in Del Rio are not pretty cases either. No, they're not pretty at all. Yeah. And you have a surviving witness to testify against him. Right. Now, that would have been a trial. Right. You don't plead to get on death row. That, that, you that's can a, plead guilty, but a jury has to assess sentencing. Okay. But he didn't plead guilty. Well, he there was never a question. He he readily admitted the case in Del Rio, along along with other cases he claimed he did. Mike, what's cooking? Um, his tales of misfortune. I have never seen a man voluntarily confess to so many crimes. What we have is a man who was born and obviously born with a very troubled background. We have some hideous crimes that he was convicted of some hideous crimes that he went to jail for, but we have a laundry list of murders that he claimed he committed that's not been able to be verified. This man has claimed on two different occasions, first that he's committed 12 murders, and then to a doctor who's studying serial killers, made it 70. 
Man was only a man for 20 years. He made his first killing at 16, and then his last killing was in 99 when he was 35. So in 20 years, he claimed he killed 70 people. It's a lot of people to kill. The amazing part is that as he went around the country trying to show police agencies the people he killed in the bodies, some of the people he claimed were dead were still alive. Some of the people that he claimed ah. were dead, they couldn't find any bodies. They got to the point that at certain points he claimed the bodies were hitting in a well. The police wouldn't even go look in the well for the bodies until they could prove there was some truth to what he's saying. So, so his credibility kind of lapsed. Well, now, now, where did they take him from? They took him from prison. From death row. From death row. And then you got this other aspect. I mean, my understanding that in prison, it's not good to be killing kids. That even people in prison do not like people who kill children. The thing is that he was convicted. I don't convic know of any audience of people that's real enthusiastic about people that kill children. In Catholic, one Catholic, of these, Catholic priests. Maybe. Catholic priests. Maybe. In <laughs> one of these cases, right. he beat a pregnant woman with a baseball bat till the baby popped out, and then he beat the newborn baby to death. There might be a scenario in which he wanted to get some bragging rights in prison. Maybe he had... When I see so many babies being killed... It makes me think that maybe he's trying to build a reputation in the prison community that he's just not a baby killer, that he kills people, too. Okay, we have, we have a telephone call. Hello? 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 You're on the air. Hello, Ray. I'm Jennifer Simmons in Houston. Okay, are you at the vigil? I am reporting from the vigil here for what? at the corner of Main and Ben Street in front of the Art Museum. Okay, next to the big Methodist church. Yeah, yeah, we have a good crowd here, about 10 people, and it's sort of misty and humid and rainy, and we're very disappointed in the Supreme Court tonight. Well, we appreciate your concern, uh, the Supreme Court. was. Th th this scenario is beginning to get all too patterned, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, we just believe there should be no secrecy in an execution protocol. Well, I, I, you know, we're going to get into that a little later in the show. I'm going to have the lawyers okay. chew that fat over there. I don't there. want to jump ahead of you all, but we think transparency is important in this process. Okay. Uh, would you give uh, our regards to the vigils and for you folks listening? In the, yeah. In the, um, the, just, just one other thing. Our organization is the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, of course. Um, and we are meeting on April 24th at the Montrose Library from 6 o'clock until 8, and we just want as many people to come out as possible who are sick and tired of, 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 of what's happening in Texas. Okay, let me repeat that because we're getting a little garble in the sound. This is the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Yes, right. And the website is T uh, C A D P. Dot org. Dot org. And the yes. next meeting is the 24th of this month. What day of the week is that? Uh, gosh, don't make me guess that right okay. now. The 24th from 6 to 8 at the Montrose Public Library. At the Montrose branch of the public library system. Exactly. Thank you, ma'am. Give our regards to the vigilance. Okay. Thank you very much, Ray. Bye-bye. And, and, and getting back. There's just certain things about these stories that make me suspicious. First of all, it seems like they have too many times he had said things they could not find, any evidence of it. But more than that, there seems to be too many cases of pretty young woman trying to help out a beggar with food and help, and she takes him home and something happens. The story's consistent. It's, and it's consistent that there's always a pretty young woman who picks him off. She's the always and takes pretty, him home and she's and always young. And, yeah, yeah. It sounds and, to me like fantasies. And we have to understand that, and then uh, sometimes. However, there is some evidence of reality in at least a couple of cases. Yes, the cases that he did are so horrible that it makes everything believable. But here becomes the problem. When you have a man who has been documented and tried and convicted of horrible, horrible crimes against women and children, he becomes a celebrity to talk. At what point in time does he become the center of attention where he can tell tales and everybody wants to listen to him? you got guards, you got people in the prison systems think, who are listening to this thing. I think, Mike, what we want to do here, let's, let's hear from Tommy himself, and then let's come back and cut okay. that particularly soft. Those of you with headphones are lucky. You can put it on. You can listen to this interview. Would you play the interview now, please? What do you think they need to know? 
Uh, and that includes about everything. I mean, my God, uh, I had uh, Lurch. Uh -huh. Remember Lurch? I'm, I know Lurch. Yeah, I did that interview with Lurch, and he said, you ain't going to run this because I got bad things about the prison show. I got bad things about excuse and watch. We ran every word of it. <laughs> well, first of all, Ray, I want, I want to make sure me and you straight. Yeah. Uh, you ain't going to do this until after they kill me, right? No, I'm going to do it while they're killing you. While they're killing me. Yeah, well, I, that's, I, 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 that, I, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Tommy, if, if, Tommy, I don't want to broadcast this show. I understand that. I hope you get a stay, and I hope something happens in your case just, like, vanishes. Yes. And I don't ever have to do it. I'm only going to use it if I do a show, and I'm going to broadcast your voice while you're mm. literally Strapped the to the table. You're going to be more than strapped to the table by the time your interview starts. Right. Okay. In the meantime, if anybody wants to get their hand on this thing, they're going to have to kill me first. Thank you. Because I ain't upping it. If I get a subpoena, I'm going to say, put my ass in jail. I ain't afraid to go to jail. Been there. Have friends there. I do well in jail. I understand. So uh, I'm not afraid of them. They ain't going to get this out of me. They ain't going to get it out of Pirtle. They ain't going to get it out of Elizabeth. Right. Now, my first question to you. Yeah. If I've heard you say over and over this is about the record that y'all go on on the execution watch. Sure. How many times you you know yourself that record be wrong? How many times have I pointed that out? How many times have I asked those lawyers questions? Well, 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 well but you, you don't... Why, why ain't this part of the interview? I haven't started the interview yet. Oh. <laughs> because, I, I thought, because, I thought, because, we, was, I thought no, no, we was going. Right. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, this is the deal. First place, I need your permission to broadcast this under the arrangements that it will not be broadcast unless you are on the gurney and the process has begun. Yes. Okay. I need your permission to show the video after that. Yes. Okay. That's cool. All of that done, uh, the interview begins. Yes. Okay. Now, before you get into what you were doing, let me say, uh, how long have you been on the road? Uh, over 13 years. Over 13 years. Yes. And you came out of Del Rio, Texas. Del Rio, Texas. And you live in Del Rio, Texas. Where are you from? No, I'm from uh, all over. Okay. I'm a gypsy child. So you were a gypsy child. You know, yeah. I mean, we've interviewed gypsy childs down here before. Uh, what were you doing out Del Rio? Uh, I met a woman down there and decided to get married. Okay. So you went to Del Rio, Texas, and uh, 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 you lived on the road everywhere. Yes. Tell me about who you were living on the road going everywhere. Who, who, who was that guy? Uh, just a burnout drug addict trying to make his way. Gypsy looking for a place to pitch a tent. Didn't even have the tent. Didn't matter the tent. Didn't, didn't give a damn about the tent. Just, I was out there in the wind. Okay, see that, that, that tells these folks who you were then. Uh, hi, you've been on death row 13 years? Yes. What has that done to you? Oh, it's it's opened my eyes to a, a whole different life that I never knew about. Uh, you've heard a lot of people say that if they could do it different, they would. I know I would because the hate left me when I, when I came here. The rage left me when I came here and, and seen all the, the, the stuff that was going on. I wasn't masking it no more. I wasn't masking the pain that I was feeling. Tell me about that pain. Uh, it just drowning out the pain of a uh, abusive childhood. And you had abusive childhood? Oh, real, real abusive. Isolated? That's, that's part of the record that we, Abandoned? Don't. Yes, yes. And how, when did you strike out on your own? Oh, 12. Were you running away or just got left on the road? Just got left out there. Just got left out there. I never had to run away. They, had, they, had, had to fend for yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And I just kept defending for myself and... Here I am on death row. 
And along the way, you doused the pain with drugs and alcohol? Very much. Did that work? No. Not even close. Not even close. It just masked, masked the pain that I was feeling and caused more rage. How old a man are you now? 49. 49. The same age? Jose? I thought you was going to say you. No. <laughs> I was going to say, come on now, Ray. I'm 73. Yeah. <laughs> You've been doing the prison show over. Damn near reverse your age, and that's my number. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did prison here for 30 years. And I thought I did a good job. Uh, that's the only reason I agreed to the interview. Uh, okay. Now, you want to talk about execution watch and prison show? Well, the we'll execution watch. The okay. execution Tell watch. me about it. Well, you have said many times, I do this, generally what, what's on the record, what we go by. And you know how many times that record's been wrong. Oh, yeah. But, but when, when they're killing that person that y'all's talking about, that's all you refer to is their record. That's all the lawyers refer to. You'll see me step in every once in a while and challenge it. It don't happen often. But it does. And the reason it does is because... I no. think they're stuck out obvious that the record. I do know what's wrong with the record. If you read the newspapers about Willingham, yes, and you read the court trial about Willingham, yes, he was one guilty son of a gun, a horrible thing. All you got to do is say there wasn't an arson, and he's totally innocent. Right. And the governor of this state has gone to the wall a dozen times so that that doesn't come out. It's in the newspapers this week. I read it about where the prosecuting attorney <laughs> uh, made a deal with, with a confidential informant. Yeah. Or the jailhouse snitch. Yeah. It wasn't no confidence yeah, it wasn't about okay. it. It was, he it get was up a there bond and, snitch. Yeah. He paid, get, bond paid for with more life. That's right. And, 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 and you know how often that happens. And, and that don't come out in the record. No, and that's it's not, not and that's not about the record that they're talking about on your show but on the execution. But watch. we have done shows. I've done shows where all of the lawyers and I agreed that they killed an innocent man that night. You remember when you, when Chester got a yeah. that dude was thrown off nine kinds of Sunday. He he was mentally challenged and retarded, yeah. and they killed a mentally challenged and retarded person. I live by that dude. I know him. Can't read, can't write. Matter of fact, uh, David uh, at, if, even couldn't hardly make out his letter. And, and you, know, you know, we just had Winston Cochran on the show. Last show we did, we had the defense lawyer in the final appeals. Appeals lawyer, Winston Cochran. Mm -hmm. First time I had Winston Cochran on, I wasn't even doing execution much. I was doing the prison show. Right. And Winston came in, he was falling to pieces. He said, my client could not even make complete sentences. He spoke in kind of word salad. And they just killed him. And I don't know how that happened. So sometimes the lawyers can't stop the determination of the state to murder. That I live with because I see that every day. I don't see, I, I see what the public don't see. I live with these fellas. They're good people. And, and, and put them in the right circumstances, they're no more in danger than, than a flea on, on, on a dog. It's, it's just, they're, they're, they're not dangerous, they're good people, and, and, and they're being killed right and left because the court's saying that there's no hope for them, and, and they're just wrong. You know, I consider myself a poster boy for the death sentence. I have no quarrels about being executed. They're, they're doing me a favor. I'm, I'm ready to get the hell out of here. Sound like work. <laughs> time to go. It's, it's, yeah, it's time to go. It's, it's like they put me on level on death watch. Yeah. And then, then write somebody up for sending me something to drink in the day room because I can't make store. And they write somebody, knowing they, they got me around all these level one people that's not going to let me suffer, but, but they're going to write them up for sending me something to drink. That's a trick bag they're putting people in back here. 
Now, this is something that happened recently? It, it ha yeah, this past week. Well, I mean, you're on death watch. I can't put you in there, Lord. Well, <laughs> you wouldn't think so, would you? No. But, but, but they, come on, Ray. You, you're not new at this game. You know if... if no, no, no. I, no, no, no. I, I, I remember, I mean, I've had conversations with Wayne Scott, who moved death row over here after Garuli. Right. Now, you weren't around on Garuli. No. no I came 2000. But, but, but those legends don't die on the row soon. No. <laughs> I, I'll follow you. Uh, Billy Hughes is alive and well on death row. Yes. Because of the, he and I and Wayne Scott as death row sergeant got the work program in place many, many years ago. Okay, and they took it. After Garuli escaped, they ended it. Yes. Because they thought he was doing some plotting and planning. Well, if Garuli was doing a lot of plotting and planning, why is he the only one who made it to the end? Right. <laughs> why, why, why have they not had a, some kind of program for us in 13 years? Yeah. Why have I not done nothing but set in Well, you sell? understand that the guards union has joined you in breaking that up. <laughs> I know y'all are talking about that back there. Here's what we know. That the only thing they know about is punishment. They, they don't pull you aside and say, you know, that, that wasn't cool what you did. Won't, won't, won't you just cut it out before we have to step up? They, they just want to put their foot on your neck, and that's all we know for sure. That's, that's, that's what we know. And, and they got their foot pretty hard on my neck right now. I'm, Over something to drink? Yeah. C cup of coffee. Something to drink? Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, it, it, so, so the other guy's supposed to get level now? Well, Dude, I mean, I'm, if I were working death row, I'd bring you a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, it, it's it, they micromanaging us just sideways. It's 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 just and 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 of course, you know, they see no wrong in it. They they want to figure out more ways to to micromanage us, and and sometimes you have to just let fellas be fellas. You know, I, I mean. <laughs> I'm on level for having a sheet up. Okay. Now, you're in a cell by yourself, you can put up a sheet. Well, apparently not, because I did and I went to level for it. Or I got leveled for it. They, they took my two special visits that, that she was on her way. They took that. Then I ain't had no commissary since, since December. And, and uh, you know, took my radio, my uh, fan, I mean, my hot pot and, and night light. And because of putting up a towel? A sheet. A sheet. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're talking about that because I think that I, my audience wants to hear that and hear what's going on because if they, nobody says it, you know, and the free world's idea is that, you know, other than the days you step out to play golf, you go to the swimming pool. If, if somebody would just pull the records on the write-ups that they do issue punishment for, they're, they're, the, the punishment don't match the, 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 the write-up. And I, I just got my step two back on. I filed a step one and step two, and they said due process was, was, was done, and we, we followed all the guidelines. They don't know about due process. Come on now due process they followed their guidelines well is if is a guard it, is says it, it, is it every guard or are there worse guards than others well you know the answer to that I'm, i mean no no it, I, but but my audience don't have a hint uh there, there there's some that that you know treat you like like decent folks and 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 they get along with people back there but then there, there's a some that just come in there with a chip on their shoulder and, and, and just wants to make a major case out of some petty ass bull and, and, and if somebody could just come and say, say man, stop that. That's yeah. all it would take. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, these people ain't so, um, the, the, the people on row ain't so hard headed that if you try to tell them something, they're not gonna listen to you. You, you follow what I'm saying? Ah, yeah, you understand, understand everything you have. More importantly, the audience, the folks that are looking over my shoulder at your face, can hear that you are sincere about what you're talking about. And that's the important thing. 
is that this is your opportunity to tell somebody what you think they need to know about where you are and what life is like there and, and, and about this whole process. Well, <clears throat> I want to get back to the record. Okay. You know, they say I'm a serial killer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that ain't, you know, no, shocking. No, 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 I've, I've run across that phrase in reading about you, yes. Yes, yes. Well, where's the proof on this, Ray? Yeah, I know. I didn't, I didn't. Have, has, have you ran across that? No, I haven't run across any, any tangible evidence that you were a serial killer. But, but they convicted me saying that I was a serial killer. They don't even have the proof. I had a lawyer in San Antonio tell me if I took that guilty plea there that they would have a better opportunity to give me a life sentence on this case if, if I done had a life sentence. That's the advice I took for taking that case in San Antonio. And, and I, I, I didn't do it. Did, you didn't. don't have any knowledge of the case in San Antonio? I couldn't even tell them it was by a, 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 a weapon or something? Huh? What? what I, no, no, uh, uh, where, where, where they keep the cattle, the uh, yeah. stockyard. Stockyard. Yeah. I couldn't even tell them it was by a, stark, a stockyard. <laughs> well, yeah, you know who you sound like is Henry Lee Lucas. Henry Lee Lucas confessed to crimes all over this country. And finally, the attorney general said, wait a minute, we're fixing to execute a man for a crime in Texas that happened 20 minutes after he is convicted of a crime that happened in Florida. How did you do that? And they asked Henry Lee Hannity. He said, well, you've seen uh, a Star Trek where you get in the thing and you tell it. <laughs> <laughs> beam me up, Scotty. And beam me up, Scotty. Yeah. And, and, and so then the governor said, no, I'm going to stay this <laughs> execution. But, but tell me about the process. They're so anxious to solve their crime that they'll hang it on anybody that comes along? Anybody that's willing to, to be gullible enough. And they'll lie, cheat, and steal to get the right kind of confession? Yes. There's no question about that in my mind. I know for a fact they catered to my needs and my wants. and, and they You got the attention? This this sounds like a flashback to Henry Lee. I mean, I was got Henry Lee confessed to all those crimes because yes. he got to travel. Yes, they took. They, they took fed me. him well. They yes, they uh, steaks and 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 I'm, I mean. And it was simply a matter of like today's comfort for the end of your life. Yes, but you're not seeing it in, in in quite that light because. Because you know you're in trouble, but 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 they're would, catering to. Would it. would you look in that camera and describe that? Uh, describe what? What we're just talking about? About about I'm isolated. I've been abandoned so much. I'm all alone in this world, and all of a sudden I'm getting all this attention. All I got to do is be the patsy. I, I had to be. They wanted me to be something that I didn't quite understand at the time. I was only uh, 35 and, 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 and coming off of drugs and alcohol. And, and they put me in a, a cell with nothing. And then they say, you know, you start talking to us and we'll, we'll work with you. It was no smoking jail, but they took me out three times a day to smoke. They, they, they provided me with, with uh, Tobacco in the cell, so so I could uh, dip and 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 uh, uh, have that nicotine fix fixed, you know. And 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 uh, the jailers would come around and 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 give me little little treats on the side. And and for for the eight months that I was in in uh, Valverde County Jail, they they treated me like 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 a king in there. And 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 you had never been treated that way before. No, no. Especially in no jail. I'm, I mean, but all this time, the Texas Rangers, you know, the good old boys coming over and, and making sure I got what I need and and, and, and uh, uh, that nobody's pressuring me over in the jail. And, and, and you know, they're getting me every day and taking me to, to the restaurants there and, and, and having us food ordered. And, and, and they took me to Arkansas and... and <sighs> Uh, Idaho and, and Las Vegas and and uh, uh, Oklahoma. We wrecked their plane in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm, I mean, it, it was an adventure. And 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 I, 
it, it, they got confessions out of me. They say, w w what do you see in the house? I'm like, well, there, there's some watermelon uh, uh, ceramic stuff, right? Now, Ray, how, how, many, how many houses got some watermelon <laughs> ceramic? <laughs> or, or watermelon plates? Tommy, or, Tommy, you are doing exactly what I want this show to do. Uh, You're telling the people in this audience the reality of your life. Uh, and you're not alone. No, no. Uh, I let them sugarcoat a bunch of stuff. Okay, Strohs, Stephanie Strohs is, is a girl that was going to um, California. I mean, from from New York to California, and she decided to hitchhike. And, and they knew that I had been out the last place that they had seen me. And, and they said, you know who Stephanie Stroh is? I said, huh. And, and they, they told me the story about she started out in California and went, was working her way to California. I said, was she a hippie? As if she would be anything else. Yeah. And because and, she's hitchhiking across country. And and she got some bongo drums with her, and 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 and, and, and that's how they said that I committed. I knew enough about the case. Yes, yes, and and it was one case after the other case. Tommy, hold hold up, hold I'm up. Running hold. out of time. I understand. The case in Illinois. They said that I killed the Dardine family, right? The 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 Texas Ranger dude came in. He said, Tommy, you know anything about that? I said, Did the dude have his cut off? And his draw, jaws dropped. I was just being a smart ass. Yeah. Sure enough, the dude had his cut off. And and that we, was evidence enough. That was evidence enough. Tommy Sales, I don't want to do this show, but I guarantee you, if I do this show, my audience will be better educated than any show I've done. You think so? Yeah. I appreciate it. Ray Hill. I'm going to be here talk to you a few minutes. I'm just ending the interview. You tell uh, Margaret, I said I love her. I'll tell everybody. Margaret especially. Yes. You hang in there, son. I hope that this day comes. I hope that madness ends it. And, and, and it worked for Henry Lee. Uh, hold it. This ain't no work for Henry Lee. Thing. No, it worked it, for Henry Lee. No, 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 no. Henry Lee was, it was realized how they had used him to solve Dozens of cases. Yes. And uh, the attorney general at the time was Jim Maddox. Mm. Went to George Bush and said, it's on you because I ain't standing behind this execution. This guy is uh, not guilty of all of these crimes. And George Bush commuted his sentence to life. I understand that, and I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to tell people. I don't the people, care what, but yeah, gonna, this ain't going to broadcast until they got you on the damn gurney. I understand that. I'm trying to tell what they will do to get that confession. Yeah. That's what I'm trying I to think, do. I think my audience needs to understand that. And they, they will lie, cheat, and steal to get that confession, the good old boys. Yeah. All they right. divide the world up into good guys and bad guys, and we're all the bad guys. Yeah. When you get back on the road, give, give the boys my love. I will. Tell them those cards and letters make a difference in my thinking. Do you like my poem? Yeah. Will you read it? Yep. When you do my show? Yep. Got your poem. I'll make it happen. Okay? That's a pretty good one, wasn't it? That's a good one. Yep. Did you read it? I did read it. All right, right. Okay. Yep. Getting here does get mighty lonely. <laughs> you know that I came to this mother sentenced to 160 years. Yes. You know, you've been here. Yeah. Worked my way out with a pencil after four years, four months, 17 days. Mm -hmm. I wish you as well. Of course, it's too late for that four, four years, four months. you got 13 in. Now, you know, I have had good lawyers. They've kept me here alive this long. Yeah. But they're not trying to hear the, the issues of my case. Yeah. My, my lawyer was the same one as Trevino that made yeah. the Trevino case. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, the state habeas lawyer was my same state habeas yeah. as Trevino's. And they say, yeah, he can get some action, but I cannot get that action. Hmm. But we had the same state habeas lawyer. Well, tell your lawyer, would Elizabeth love to talk to him? 
uh, Hillary Shear. Hillary Shear, you got that, Elizabeth? Matter of fact, she Hillary Shear. It's on tape. She 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 said about you in particular, you're the worst of the evils. Okay. Doing interviews for her. she. I know, she, I know, I know. She doesn't understand that I will go to jail before anyone gets their hands on. Oh uh, no, no. She, she, yes, yeah, she did understand that. She, she knew that 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 talking to you was was not a problem. Okay. She, she gave her blessing. Okay. In a roundabout way. Okay. Well, listen. I love you. All right. Good luck. Give my love to the boys. I will. Well, this is um, Ray Hillback, and uh, that was an interview with Tommy Sales. Tommy Sales is dead. At about uh, 10 minutes ago, about 6.30, uh, we got uh, word that the witnesses had come out. That was a little bit different time. The last time the witnesses crossed the road, they were in there for 52 minutes. This time they were in there for less than 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So whatever new drugs they've got seem to be uh, more efficient than the drugs they were using on this day last week. Uh, uh, Mike Gillespie stepped back from the, tele the microphone, having uh, been pleased that I asked <laughs> Tommy the questions he wanted to raise. Uh, uh, you will be able to see that interview and its extended form when the videotape is compiled for Houston Media Source. Larry Douglas, what um, what's your take on this? Well, Jim and I were talking about the the uh, tragedy of um, of of the of of, of, of Tommy Lynn's seals his whole life, and uh, the quote came up. Uh, I think he died the day that he was born. Uh, that's a quote from a boxing promoter regarding the tragic life and the sudden death of of, of former heavyweight boxing champion. Uh, Charles Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston, yeah. Liston had a, had a tragic life, but it does not in any way compare to the life of, of Tommy Lynn Sales. Uh, he, he never had a chance. Uh, Tommy Lynn and he had a twin sister, uh, Tammy Jean Sales, uh, were born in, in Alameda County, California. At the time they were born, uh, the, the mother and father allowed them to allowed the father sales to be to have the children named after him uh but 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 his actual father w w was not sales but actually a guy named uh, joe lovins and this was a scheme because sales was an insurance salesman mm -hmm. and he used the children he named them in order to, to, to get up on an insurance scheme oh he was he was going to beat the insurance company out of some money apparently so okay. well when they were about 18 months old, the mother moved the children. And there, there were several children by this time because there were two older brothers and the twins were born and then three younger brothers. 18 months old, he, the, the mother moved the family to the uh, the St. Louis area. And shortly thereafter, uh, they both got meningitis. The sister, uh, Tammy, died. Uh, Tommy survived. But Tommy's survival was, was to a cruel life. And back by the time he was two years old, his mother sent him to live with an aunt. Uh, for from the time he was two years old till about the time he was five years old, we don't know ex exactly what happened up during that time. But during the time frame, the the, the aunt asked to uh, to adopt Tommy, and the mother just exploded about that. She says she went and took took Tommy back, and told the aunt the aunt couldn't even have any contact with him anymore. Uh, and Tommy was a difficult child. He started to skip school at the age of seven. Uh, he was smoking by the age of eight, uh, using pot by the age of nine or 10 years old. Uh, and as a very young boy, uh, a young man, uh, an old, a grown man took, took a liking to him and started lavishing him with gifts and so forth. But as it turned out that young, that, 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 that grown man was a, was a pedophile. Um, and, uh, uh, and by the time Tommy got to be 12, 14, 13, 14 years old. He was he was pretty much on on his own. Now, one thing that his that his father did do for him, the 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 the, the actual biological father, uh, he remembers his his father uh, Joe Levins uh, telling him that uh, dead men tell no tales. Uh, and so Tommy claims that some of the things that he did was to make sure that there were no witnesses 
uh, to his actions. One of the other things that Tommy did, which, which was really uh, shocking to a lot of people, is that he's, he's reported to have crawled in the, in the bed naked uh, with his grandmother when he was 13 years old. And he's alleged to have tried to rape his own mother. Uh, and at that point, he did undergo some kind of uh, mental examination. But by the time he got to be about 14, 15 years old, Tommy was pretty much on his own. He, like I said, he didn't run away. Just nobody cared about him. So he went out on his own, and, and he reports that he was hop trains, uh, steel, and do whatever he had to do to survive. Become that drifter that they talk about. That's when he reports to have become the drifter. Uh, Larry... When you're folks like, I, I know folks like Tommy. I know the folks that have never really had a life uh, that you and I would recognize as a life. They've been nobody all of their lives. They have no purpose. Uh, uh, they have no friends. They have, uh, they have not had any pleasurable moments. It's been a struggle from meal to meal, from... Uh, dry place to sleep to dry place to sleep. And uh, those dry places frequently include the bugs of the night and the heat and the cold. Uh, uh, how would Tommy have ever developed a feeling that his life had any value? Well, Ray, uh, despite all of those things that he was deprived of, uh, it's my understanding, we discussed this earlier, that uh, the greatest human need is the, the need to feel like he's somebody. So even even if you are if you don't have a whole lot, uh, even if you you're struggling from meal to meal, place to place, if there's someone who values you, because a lot of times families uh, uh, don't have a lot, uh, but but if they have each other, that's that's about all they need. Uh, Tommy uh, uh, apparently seems to have never had that feeling. Uh, uh, even even being with a grown man who was molesting little boys, including Tommy. Um, that may have made him feel like he was somebody because man did lavish gifts and so forth and attention on him. He never had any, any, Nobody any real attention. Did. No, no, no real caring so, so, person. So the only did. attention that he got in his life was attention leading to exploitation. That very negative attention. Absolutely. But even negative attention is better than no attention at all uh, to, to a human being because, because we do need that to survive. Thank you, Larry. I want to I want to bring Jack into the conversation because Jack's going to talk about chemistry for a while. Uh, Jim, this show's actually holding it together pretty good. Yeah, you know one of the things Ray that you brought up, and I don't, of course you met him, I didn't. Uh, usually, when a kid has a bad background, a lot of it depends on what type of intellect they got. If they're a little bit bright, they can kind of their brain kind of tells their stomach those feelings are dangerous. <clears throat> But if a little guy's a little slow and not very bright, they're lost if they go through a background like this. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people who've had tragic backgrounds that over, have overcome it. Sure. But they've overcome it because they're pretty bright people. And usually somebody intervenes. And we have that deal called disassociation when people don't bond when they're infants. And it might very well be that he didn't bond with his mother. There's a lot, lot to here. Speaking of disassociation, there's been a lot of discussion of the chemistry, Jack. Sure. The main issue with uh, regarding the chemistry and the drugs that are used in lethal injection is whether the condemned suffers or not. And as a subset of that, in order to figure that out, it makes sense that you need to know which, which drugs are used and where they come from. A Texas judge ordered the uh, state te uh, state prison officials to disclose to inmates where they got their latest batch of lethal uh, lethal injection drugs. The idea is that the inmate would need to know uh, both the drug being used and its manufacturer. Not surprisingly, pharmaceuticals really don't uh, manuf uh, these drug manufacturers don't want to be publicized for making the lethal injection drugs. If the manufacturers are known, manufacturers may uh, may have protests. There may be other legal uh, legal hassles, and there's the possibility of greater scrutiny. Uh, that notwithstanding, manufact um, several manufacturers have re simply refused to sell drugs for executions based upon moral grounds. As a result, the state has now turned to smaller compounding pharmacies to come up with the drugs. Compounding pharmacies will take the drugs and they will manufacture it in small, very small batches themselves. 
these pharmaceuticals are less regulated, which brings up the possibility that the drugs may not perform uh, the way they're supposed to. And ultimately, that's, uh, that's played into the cell's execution largely because uh, uh, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the attorney general at first said, all right, state prison officials, uh, here's our opinion. We believe you do need to disclose the, uh, disclose the manufacturers. And then the AG's office came back and said, no, you really don't. And then a judge said, yes, you do. Wait a minute. And it's going back and forth. I, I, I'm, I may be completely off base here, but if you spend the taxpayer's money to buy a truck, mm -hmm. somewhere there is a public accessible record of where you bought the truck and how much you paid for it. Sure. Isn't there a publicly accessible record of where they bought the drugs and how much they paid for it? I don't believe there is, and and this is ultimately the legal issue. The defend uh, the um, the inmates want to know who the manufacturer is, sure. and, and it makes good sense. If you want, uh, if you want to know whether these uh, these. Uh, drugs that are being injected into into you are medically um, are, sure. are you know medically competent or um, you know um, they're medical grade or not. Now it occurred to me that there may be some that a lot some people would would think well what difference does it make they're going to be executed anyways well what happens if the execution is not successful or it's unsuccessful in such a way that it does in fact uh, violate the constitution in in terms of causing cruel and unusual punishment. Hey, we I, just went through an execution in Missouri where the guy lay there suffering, struggling for breath for an inordinately long time. It was something like 20 minutes. The witness, mm -hmm. a witness is in case. And the last time we did an execution in Texas, uh, the uh, they were witnesses were in there an inordinately long time. This is relatively quick. What is the drug we're talking about? Uh, it's phenobarbital. Um, let me. It's phenobarbital. Phenobarbital. Why wouldn't they just give them heroin? Well, not being a prison official, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. But I mean, I think heroin will kill you in overdose. I mean, no question about it. You uh, have to have it locked up in a very safe place, okay? <laughs> You would have to have your heroin locked up. I'll tell you the way to do it. Steal it. You let the warden sell it, and then they'd probably use it. You right. let the warden sell it. They sell all the type of drugs. Well, they sell all the kinds of That's drugs. That's what I'm in saying, right. all the time. Let them know they can sell the heroin under the table, and they could probably do that. They, they can find enough out. of it. Exactly. Take it to go down the hall and, That's right. and, and shake down a couple of people and get enough heroin for the next execution. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, Jesus. They well, couldn't control you it, You call right? me Jim. It's all right. They'd, ha they'd have to have it locked under lock and key. Oh, okay, okay. Even then, Wait, that might not This is beginning work. to make sense okay. to me, actually. <laughs> and having known a couple of heroin addicts, this is beginning to make sense to me. In fact, I can even mention the fact if you use it for drugs, some may kill just to get the last shot for the state to pay for it. I don't know. I, I want that Bayer brand. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but the best. And Ray, when answer your question earlier, what the DDC did on that last batch, remember, Jack, and they got it from Connor. They lied to the <laughs> pharmaceutical companies that they were going to use it to treat somebody in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then when the pharmacists, because see, the problem, the medical profession, the pharmacists are part of it, is designed to, to save people's lives. Not it's right. a real ethical problem. If your job is to save folks and all of a sudden you're selling stuff to kill them, that's the, a real ethical problem with the medical profession. The American Medical Association has uh, stated that whether or not physicians assist in executions or not is a personal choice. Okay. And that uh, the AMA is not going to get involved. Uh, I think one of the issues that when I was uh, thinking about this issue of why it matters, what uh, what drugs we use, what uh, for the lethal injection, and what uh, and why that's important, why it matters, I w was reminded of the reign of terror in uh, in France under Robespierre, where they executed so many people in the with a guillotine that the blade became so dull that. It, very it few people. It didn't work. Very few people made you know were actually executed on the first chop. Uh, several times they, several oh people you know lot, towards the end, a lot of people had to be you know had to go through several ec several chops. chops before they were actually executed. Mm. It's terrible. I mean, you look at uh, Louis the Sixteenth. He was so large that the blade simply could not fit through his neck on the first chop. And he uh, went through several times before his uh, before he was actually executed, and this is really the the crux of the issue behind 
the uh, why the drug man uh, why the inmates want uh, the drug manufacturers names uh, disclosed it, that they need they need this information to figure out if it violates uh, the constitutional um, uh, right not to be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment well, I guess we owe a um, debt of gratitude to Tommy Sales for giving us an opportunity to talk about things on this show that we don't normally get around to talking to. We certainly are exposed to a person whose personality is very different from any that most of you will encounter. But I want to assure you, having lived in prison, that there are Tommy Sales down there. And there is a problem. If you've been nobody all of your life and of no consequence to anybody and nobody's ever cared about you and you wind up in a Texas prison and you're given responsibilities by the authorities so that while in prison you become somebody, Richard's on the line. it is very difficult to, uh, it's very get difficult to get out of that. Uh, Richard is back online. Could you put him on the air? Richard? Yes, sir. Uh, the witnesses came out, what, about the middle of the hour? Uh, when the first group of witnesses came out at 6.32, the lawyers about five minutes later, and the state witnesses about five minutes after that. Okay, so uh, the, the obviously the execution was over travel distance from death row to the front gate uh, at uh, 6.30. Yes, sir. Uh, so this went a lot quicker than the one last week. Yes, sir. And uh, I uh, I appreciate your... By the way, Richard owes Harley-Davidson the transportation ability to get to Huntsville and uh, cover this for us. Thank you, Richard, for doing that. Not a problem, sir. Enjoy your ride home. Later. Bye. And so now he's got to straddle that Harley. I hope he carried his rain suit. <laughs> Well, Ray, I would say this, if, you know, for people who may feel like they're nobody and nothing to anybody, I would point this out, that you can make your own karma. If you do good things for people and care about people and help people out, then you're going to be somebody to them. Susan, the trouble with sending messages to people that need to receive those mm -hmm. messages. We don't have a very effective mechanism for doing that. That is true. Somebody should have told Tommy Sales that when he was about 13 years old and uh, given him a few guidelines how to build that karma. The karma he built was destined. Uh, I don't. I think I agree with Larry. This guy died the day he was born. And uh, uh, I will... It'll be a long time before I get Tommy sailed. You're listening to Execution Watch on radio station KPFT in Houston. If you want to see this show, uh, those of us in the studio, as well as an extended interview with Tommy Sales, stay tuned at Ex uh, Execution Watch, the Facebook page, uh, and we will figure out somehow to put a notice of it also on the web page. And ultimately, both this audio of this show and the video will be posted on executionwatch.org. My name is Ray Hill. I want to thank uh, Jim Skelton, Susan Ashley, uh, Mike Gillespie, uh, and, and Jack Lee for their fine work on uh, this research and getting ready for this case. I want to thank, of course, uh, Elizabeth Stein, their producer, without whom we couldn't work. A lot more of the wizardry as we develop that. Credit goes to Otis McClay, who is handling cameras tonight. And uh, we appreciate it. And, of course, Mark Pirtle plays a role in all that. I want to thank KPFT for giving us the opportunity and providing us with their board operator for tonight's show. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Victoria Panetti for playing. Did I leave Larry out? Left Larry out. Oh, my God. How could I leave the voice of God himself? Larry, Larry and, and, and I'm here. I just quoted his wisdom uh, he brought to the table tonight, that Sonny Liston quote. Uh, uh, I never forget these shows. I hope you will view them and listen to them. And remember, we owe it as citizens in a state that ritually kills people in our name.